Hello YouTube, my name is Zach, and today I'm going to be analyzing Tony Kako of Sonata Arctica. First, before I start, I'd like to give a big thank you to Samu. He is one of my patrons, and he actually requested Tony last month, but I had so many other things on the agenda that I wasn't actually able to do it, so better late than never, right? And uh, so this is someone he requested. I've also gotten a lot of requests from people in the comments throughout the past few months to analyze Tony as well, so this should be pretty fun. So let's jump straight to it. First of all, a quick disclaimer to those of you who've never seen my content. This video is made strictly for educational purposes. This is not a reaction video. I've already thoroughly analyzed Tony prior to this recording. I'm a professional voice teacher at a music studio in Atlanta, Georgia, and I've taught hundreds of voices, both male and female, in most genres from the ages of 5 to 60. I base my analyses upon academically sourced health-based principles. If you want to learn a bit more about the basis of my pedagogy, I encourage you to check out Naps.org and peruse the Journal of Singing. It's been the authoritative source of all things vocal pedagogy related in the United States for the last 75 years. Artistry and technique are equally important in singing, and throughout my research of the YouTube landscape, I've found that there's a much greater emphasis on artistry across the board than technique, and I aim to counterbalance that with some more objective commentary. As such, my videos tend to de-emphasize the artistic intention of the singer. My doing so does not invalidate the singer's skill or efficacy in displaying his or her artistic ideals, but perhaps instead offers a different lens by which to view the process of singing and phonation. I seek out what I call teachable moments and as a result, this video will contain both praise and constructive criticism. I humbly encourage you to view the critiques from strictly an educational paradigm and not as an affront on Tony himself. My goal ultimately is to help you learn more about your own singing. Moving right along, here are a few pros and cons of Tony's technique. For pros, first off, he has very good control over dynamics. Second off, he has very good pitch acuity and legato, despite the fact that some of these melodic passages are pretty difficult. And third of all, he manages his breath well across the phrases that he sings. The cons would be, one, that he relies on force and pressure on the top end of his range. Uh, two, he uses nasality to combat the excessive pressure. And third of all, he physically forces the vibrato rather than letting it be a byproduct of good technique. I'm also going to go ahead and tell you up front about glottal onsets. In case you've never seen my content, a glottal onset is when the folds pop together when you begin a word that starts with a vowel. And I've decided to start telling people this up front because most of these contemporary singers that I analyze have glottal onsets and I want to be able to point them out as it goes on so I don't have to spend forever talking about it. Also one last thing in case you didn't know the YouTube copyright police are all over the place and it's really hard to produce content that has anything that's not licensed specifically for YouTube anything that's by any of these major groups like UMG or WMG or whatever it's really hard to post them and it's getting increasingly more difficult by the day. Uh, I don't know if this is going to get copyright stricken. If it does, I'll just you know demonetize it, take ads off, all that kind of thing. So I'm probably going to have to chop the audio up a lot. There's just not any other really good solution for content that isn't licensed specifically for YouTube. So I'm sorry about that up front. I wish there was something I could do about it, but it's completely out of my hands. And there are way bigger YouTubers than me that have been trying to solve this problem, and they're not really getting anywhere either. This is The Misery Live in Finland. Let's get started. So before I really get into the, the con elements of his technique, I want to talk about some good things that he's doing first here. When he's singing in this kind of da 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 da, and I don't know the words, so you're going to have to bear with me here. When he sings in this kind of range with that sort of like mezzo piano dynamic, it's very common that you'll hear singers of this genre and really of any popular genre kind of put the air through like this. And it's pretty destructive to the singing mechanism when you do that because what happens is the vocal folds don't close. When there's an extra source of air, the fold closure, which is what makes us sing and what makes us phonate, is inhibited by the extra air pushing through the glottis or the point where the folds touch. So as a result, it can lead to damage because the workload across the folds gets unevenly distributed, you know, that kind of deal. And I've discussed this many times in prior videos. I say all that to say that he's doing a really good job of keeping the sound on the voice. In other words, on the voice means that he's letting the folds close and controlling his dynamics through the amount of pressure of air that comes through. So that's a very good thing about his technique here. And I think I mentioned that in the pros. That he's got very good dynamic control. And just the beginning of this is an excellent example of that. So there's a few things here to point out. For example, when you when he sung the word sunlight, well, you could hear this kind of sunlight, sunlight kind of thing. What he's doing there is he's placing the resonance in his nasal cavity. And 
in this case, in the range that he's singing at this point, it's not the end of the world. Some people kind of like the nasal sound and some people don't. I'm not partial to it because I just don't really understand the reasoning for it. And by don't understand, I don't mean that like, I don't understand how it works. I mean, like, I don't see why you don't just place the resonance in the mouth. Um, in my view, and this is just my opinion, nasality kind of impedes the tone a bit. So, for example, if I say, La, and that's kind of in the vein of everyone's favorite, if I can't do it, no one can buy my singing training course DVD YouTuber that we all know and love. What that does is it kind of inhibits the tone. So uh, listen to la as opposed to la. So you can hear the difference between the two, that there's a much richer, more robust sound and tone that comes from keeping the resonance placed in the mouth as opposed to putting it in the nasal cavity. It's pretty prominent in metal and in pop music. People do it all the time. Honestly, I think it's probably more because one, people aren't trained not to, and a lot of singers in these genres aren't trained singers anyway, so they just make sound however they know how to make sound. Now, right now, it's not a big deal because when you're singing using nasal resonance in your lower range, it's not a big deal because the likelihood of you pushing and using pressure is a lot less. But you'll find that as he moves up in pitch and it gets higher, you're going to see that he kind of converts that nasality into a pretty forced push sound, and you'll see what I mean. He's got really nice phrasing, and so phrasing is one of those things that people misuse the term a lot, but by phrasing, what I mean is that he allows his voice to follow the contour of the line, and the lines are pretty long, and he does a good job of placing the choices of where he breathes that makes sense. Like, if someone's talking in the middle of a sentence and then they breathe, it's kind of weird and it doesn't sound right and it kind of messes up the flow of the, the sentence or the phrase the person is speaking. Singing is very similar. He does a very good job of placing his points of breath in ways that one, he has time to get the breath to carry through the next phrase and two, to where it makes sense in context of the melody. So that's a really underrated skill. A lot of singers just don't even think about that and you'll see them in live performance and they'll just take random breaths in random places and it doesn't make a lot of sense. He's doing a very good job of managing it. Another thing he does a very good job of is legato. And if you've never seen my videos before, you should know that legato or long and connected sounds and vowels are in my view, the absolute pinnacle of singing. Uh, and the reason being that we speak in a legato style and when we talk, we kind of allow our vowels to carry from word to word, whether we realize it or not. So we as listeners are drawn to that more often because it sounds similar to how we're communicated to when someone speaks to us. He does a good job, if you listen to the singing in this kind of softer section, of allowing each vowel to carry the entire duration of a word into the next word. So that's all very good. Very good fundamental singing technique in that sense, and something that I wish more singers would take on as well. Uh, I think Steve Perry was another singer that I've talked about that had excellent legato. I think uh, Floor Janssen had pretty good legato as well, if I recall, but definitely Steve Perry was another example of it. Tony's in this particular se section of the song does a very good job with legato as well. So if you listen to the, if you fall, and I'm a baritone, I'm not a tenor, so I'm not even going to try to sing that in full voice in his range. But if you listen to where he sung fall, he kind of goes, fall. He does that kind of sound. That's the nasality. And anytime you hear a vowel that sounds like it has an uh kind of attached to it, it's usually using nasal resonance to be created. So when he sung fall, he went fa, fa, like that. So that's an example of nasality. And when you move up into the range, you typically don't want to do that because most of the time when you're in the high point of your voice, nasality happens as a byproduct of you releasing pressure in the mechanism. So like... um. When you make sound, there's a certain amount of pressure that comes up from the folds underneath when they vibrate and the air that comes through the glottis when you speak or sing or whatever. And above it, there's this space that's called the larynx. And the larynx can get larger or smaller based upon how you position it or configure it. And when the vibration moves up the larynx, the amount of pressure it carries through is very closely related to how much space there is in the vocal tract of the larynx. So if the larynx is very high and there's not a lot of space, if you have a lot of pressure coming from down below, well, that pressure's all got to go somewhere. And it's very easy to open the nasal port and allow nasality to enter the sound because it can function as like a pressure valve. Some of that extra resonance and vibration 
machine can just move up this extra tract. But the problem with that is that the core of the issue isn't necessarily the nasality. The core of the issue is that there's pressure coming from underneath. And I know this is a little bit technical and a little bit more advanced than what I typically go into, but I want you all to kind of understand why nasality isn't necessarily a desirable thing in a singing sound, even if the person hits the note. It's still something that you typically want to avoid because a lot of times when nasality becomes a habit, it's a byproduct of too much pressure in the throat. Hopefully that makes some sense. So, uh, uh, at the beginning of and, he went, uh, like that. That's the example of that glottal onset thing I was talking about. So, anytime you hear that, uh, sound, you know that the glottis is popping together like that. Again, that's a sign of a lot of pressure coming from underneath. And when the glottis pops together, that's the folds pushing against each other very quickly and aggressively to release that pressure that's up, that's coming from underneath. So, again, it's another sign that his singing has a lot of pressure. He's, he's got a lot of push coming from beneath when he sings. Yeah, really nice legato across the board. The line is very consistent. The sound of the vowels carries through the words very well. Now, I know he did that raspy thing, and I don't do the rasp stuff. I'm not trained in it, and I'm not convinced that any of the science that's out there is well-researched or well-founded. I know you can take that up with me at another time if you have issue with it, but I don't do the rasp stuff. So if you're looking for me to make comments on that, I'm not going to. And if that's something that you're interested in doing, I would say that there are resources out there that can show you how to do it. But I would be very careful because I don't believe that any of the pedagogy that they utilize is sound or backed by good science. Therefore, I don't know how sustainable it is. My personal view on the issue, and this is going to be it. Of, about the RAF stuff is that it's closely linked to genetics. I've had multiple accounts of professional singers talk to me about it who said that there are some singers that come to into the touring scene and the singing scene, they can rasp all their lives, and there's some of them that can't make it through a single tour. So it's on a case-by-case -case basis. I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, yeah, you can do it safely, and I tell... And I also say to be careful and be aware of anyone who says that it is safe and healthy, especially if they don't have conclusive, peer-reviewed evidence to back it up. And it's going to be very hard to find that. That rant aside, I'm not going to go into that anymore. If you hear a rasp, you know my view on it. Um, the good sides of everything he's doing, his pitch is excellent. Like, he's not flat. A lot of times when you have singers singing in this kind of style, you hear, like, occasionally flat pitches, things like sag, the notes kind of sag. None of that. All very good. If he didn't have good breath support, or in other words, he weren't working his breathing mechanism in a, in a healthy, good way, then he wouldn't be able to sing through these phrases so consistently. I've listened to some of their older material, too, and it seems to me that... As he aged, he worked pretty hard to develop some of these core elements of his technique because, like, I saw this, uh, I saw this recording of Wolf and Raven from I don't know, it was definitely a long time ago. But when I hear the way he managed his breath then compared to how he manages it now, it's like night and day. So I don't know how much training he's had. I did a little bit of cursory research. I didn't see that he had any training when he started singing, but I'm pretty convinced that based on how he's learned to manage some of these phrases and some of these pitches and some of his breathing, that he's definitely had some sort, some degree of training or, or work in that specific area. And kudos to him because his singing is far more consistent as a result of it. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of nasality in this singing, but one thing that I will say is a positive out of it is that he's very consistent. A lot of those notes and those phrases were all kind of in the same range. Da, 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 da. Of course, an octave up for me, but, but it's all kind of in that same range, and you don't hear this big distinction in the way that he delivers those notes from iteration to iteration. And really, that's just indicative of having some pretty consistent technique. Whether his technique is sustainable and healthy, I don't know. That kind of nasality, I feel like, is kind of up for debate as to whether or not it's sustainable or not. But I do know that what he's doing is consistent. So I would rather see someone with slightly bad, consistent technique than to see someone with occasionally really good but occasionally really bad technique and it sounds really inconsistent so you know there are pros and cons he obviously is an effective singer and artist and and he does a good job of conveying the the emotion of the music I and mean, he does a good job of that so it all works in tandem together in that sense but i would definitely say that if i worked with him on my own i would try to get him to cut down on that nasality if you find that nasality is an issue in your singing the first thing i would suggest that you do plug your nose. You're going to see that a lot on the internet. Like you can probably look up videos from all sorts of teachers who said plug your nose to combat nasality. And and it's true. And the reason is that you're just closing the, the resonance port. So like, you know, 
Nasal, <laughs> nasal resonance can't go through if you if you plug your nose because the, the holes are stopped up. So um, if you feel like you're having trouble with nasality, just hold your nose some when you sing. It's going to make things feel very different. But if you're doing it right, then the sound should kind of travel back into your mouth. You know, it is what it is. And he's a good singer. So, I, you know, he, he's been doing this thing for however many years it's been. And he's been making it work for him. And it creates a distinctive sound. And that's one thing that nasality can do for you. Like country music, for example. No country singer is going to sound like a country country singer without having that nasal thing going on, right? So, I mean, there it does have its merits, but in a strictly technical sense, usually the sound is created as a byproduct of something going wrong underneath. So, you know, there's both sides of it. Um, you can take it for what it's worth. You can feel free to have your own opinions about it. If you like how it sounds, that's totally okay. It's just a little bit of physiology about it for you. Okay, so there on, I guess the word is crown or ground. I don't know. Whatever that word was with the owl vowel on it. You saw that he shook his head. What he did is he created an artificial vibrato. So if I went, ah, like that's literally what he did to create a vibrato. Um, what that means is that he wants a vibrato, but his voice is not configuring itself in the proper position to have a vibrato occur. Vibrato most often naturally occurs when the folds are completely relaxed and they're fully closed and there's an oscillation that occurs on the outside when they go to vibrate. And in my experience analyzing a lot of these professional singers, what I'm finding is that I think a lot of them have like a backup technique that they use if they don't have the vibrato that day for whatever reason, where they can do something physical to manipulate the mechanism into making like a, a false vibrato. And I know that's a weird word to say, but but I say false vibrato because well, when you talk about a, a true vibrato, what you refer to is that natural oscillation. So anytime a vibrato occurs that isn't a byproduct of full chord closure and the natural oscillation of the folds, the vibrato isn't a true vibrato because it's being created by some external factor other than the mechanism itself. So I think a lot of professional singers kind of have a backup plan. And I mean, just shaking your head isn't going to make a big difference in terms of the technique. I guess it engages muscles that it probably shouldn't engage. In my view, coming from the classical realm, you know, we're trained to keep that larynx low and, you know, kind of keep things relaxed all the time so that we always have that, oh, like it's always just there. Oh, oh, oh. No matter what pitch we're on, we've got the vibrato just waiting there. But that comes from having a very specific, very stylized setup in the throat. And, and that's why a lot of times, like, classical singing is so different from contemporary singing is that we have this very specific position we want to create so that we have a consistent sound that's always there. Anyway, that's enough about that. Let's move on. So before he went into that raspy thing, he did an eval. I guess the word is story, maybe on the eval. You heard this story e kind of thing. And yeah, that's the beginning of the raspy sound. But even if you listen to the way that the eval phonates, an eval is typically bright. E, E, E. It's not E, E, E. And so what he's doing there to make that E sound is he's making an over adjustment in the vocal track to try to make, I guess maybe it helps him with that raspy thing. I'm not sure. But usually when you hear an E with that kind of sound, it's a lot of pressure buildup underneath that causes it. So if you just say E, like the word even, you don't feel a ton of pressure underneath. But if you go even, you're going to feel like a welling up, like a, like a puff of air come from underneath when you do that. And that's indicative of the amount of pressure he's using when he moves up into the upper range. It's not good for your voice to do that, period. Whenever you make too much pressure pass through the glottis or you have extraneous subglottal pressure, we call it, the only thing that can happen is the muscles around the mechanism and in the larynx have to overwork to manage all of it. So using that kind of pressure is not good for you. And I know that it's prominent in metal and I know that the sound is kind of a byproduct of the genre. But when I teach, I try as hard as I can to get that pressure out of the student's sound no matter the genre. And I do have students who sing metal. And it works, but you, you have to understand that you're going to lose a little bit of that edge in the sound. And it's, it's like a trade-off, you know. How much of the edginess are you willing to sacrifice for the sake of singing with a healthier technique? And, you know, some singers don't even know how to make that decision. My role isn't to tell someone, you can't do this with your voice. My role as a voice teacher is to say, here's how to do it this way. 
Here's how to do it that way. These are your options. Know the ramifications of both. Make your own decision. So a lot of times these metal singers don't even know about that kind of thing. And so I think Tony is in his 40s now at this point, if I'm not mistaken, like mid 40s. And I don't know how long someone can sing with that kind of pressure sustainably. I mean, I don't know too much about him now, but maybe you guys can tell me a little bit about how his voice is developed or if it's decayed or anything like that. But without a doubt, you definitely want to be careful when you're singing with that kind of pressure. So that little voice crack on ever, what that probably means most of the time, and when you get that little ever uh, kind of thing, usually is a sign of vocal fatigue because the folds are having trouble staying closed. That means the muscles around them that keep that in place are kind of struggling to hold everything together. So he probably is a little bit vocally fatigued, and it would make sense. I mean, he just sung an extremely demanding part of the song. The way you can apply this to yourself is if you go to sing and it starts feeling like notes are harder to hold and things things break a little bit more. You need to take a rest, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. And when you come back to singing, sing from a low pitch, like kind of do a little mini warm up from a low pitch and gradually work your way back up. Do not jump right back into singing full blast. And unfortunately, when you're on stage, you don't have that luxury. But just so you know, whenever your voice cracks like that, your body's telling you, hang on, we're having trouble holding things in place. So that might help you to know that. One thing I do have to say that I typically point out with a lot of metal singers is how much facial tension they have. And the only time I've really seen that in him is when it's like really, really raspy, heavy stuff. Across the board, he seems to have a pretty good control over the amount of tension that he creates in his upper body, which I find really interesting considering how much pressure he's using to sing. He managed to somehow keep the facial tension out of the equation. I don't know. It's it's That's pretty unique. That's something you don't see a lot. Because a lot of times when you get a lot of pressure underneath, it shows in their face. I don't know. Maybe he's found a way just to keep his head relaxed while his, his vocal folds are working in overdrive. I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, I'm like a broken record here. I said it earlier, but I mean, he's got great control of his dynamics. I mean, there's so much of that missing in modern singers. Like they only sing like one or two volumes, period. But he's done a really good job of having the really big, huge sound and a very small, delicate sound. And it takes a lot of control. It sounds easier than it is. And what's even harder is doing it without putting a lot of air through. Like I said, most contemporary singers like to use that uh, uh, push of air to make that low dynamic sound, the, the mezzo piano type stuff. In his case, he doesn't. It's just on the voice. It's really hard to control, really hard to learn to do. In some other videos, you probably heard me talk about Mesa di Voce. Well, that's a perfect example when you can take it down here and you can be very light and soft and it gradually gets louder, 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 and then you can dial it back like that just gradually and get it back down to soft again. That's Mesa di Voce. So the fact that he can demonstrate that well is very good. But I'm pretty sure he's done some work on his technique over the years, especially when I compare it to his like younger singing. Because right? you can't just wake up and do Mesa di Voce like that. You, you, just, you just can't. It takes practice. So he said, my dear, and I'm just going to be really nitpicky. I always tell my students, don't do your best because that means they get to be harder on you. So if he does something really well, I'm always going to find something to, to pick on him about. And I'm, I'm like that with all my students because, you know, we're never perfect. I'm never perfect. You're never perfect. No one is. When he did my dear, he went my dear, right? So the word my is weird and then it has my, right? So it has both the my in it, the ah and the eval. And how do you manage that? Well, Typically, when you sing in English, you want to keep that first vowel there. You don't want to lean on the second vowel. That's called a diphthong. And so if you lean on the second vowel too much, it makes it sound like a different word. So my, it almost sounds like I said me with an ah right before it. So my, the word my is my, and the e is at the very end. So if you aren't a native English speaker and you're trying to learn how to sing in English, that kind of thing, or if you are an English speaker and you feel like you struggle with diphthongs a lot, focus on the first vowel that you sing and then take the second vowel and put it on the tail end of the of the word so my like that that's how you manage the diphthong that's all there is to it yeah i mean look at his face he's doing all this crazy high stuff and there's no tension here i mean that's 
definitely noteworthy because most of the time when you hear this kind of singing from metal singers, they're like, got this kind of thing going on. So he's found some way to do this without tightening up. So that's going to lend to vocal sustainability in and of itself. That'll add years onto his career that a lot of people won't. So good on him for that for sure. So that was really nice. He did a melisma there. A melisma is when you sing multiple notes on one vowel. And anytime you hear that in like pop or metal or anything, it's going to have that like bluesy, like, ah, 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 that kind of thing. Those are melismas. It all started actually back in the Baroque era with Bach. He was like the king of melisma. Um, I know from personal experience of singing those pieces are in this nightmare. So, uh, um, but yeah, really nice. Anytime someone can make a consistent melisma and all the notes are clear, that means they have a good sense of legato and that means they have good breath support because you cannot make melisma happen without being able to control your breath effectively. It just takes such good air control and such good control of the amount of pressure that comes from underneath when you sing that vowel that it's, it's not the easiest thing in the world. Good on him. Very nice. And that's basically it. He sung a couple more words, but nothing really notable. Okay, so I know that this was kind of all over the place. I had a lot to talk about with his voice because it, he, he has so much good going on and he has some technical problems at the same time. But it's kind of like I'm torn on how to assess him. On one hand, he has refined a very distinctive singing sound and style that he seems to make work for him pretty well. On the other hand, I would not recommend people sing with the amount of force and pressure that he sings with. I, I like him. I think he's good. Um, I, I don't know. He, he, it's, it's definitely an interesting case because if a student came to me with this kind of singing sound, I would not want to universally transform the way they phonate or, or create pitches and the way they, they sing. I wouldn't want to do that. But I think there are elements of his singing that could be worked out that the audience wouldn't even know about, like the, the glottal onset stuff. Some of, like some of the excessive buildup of pressure from underneath that could probably be mitigated to some extent. Maybe opening up the vocal tract a little bit more on some of the higher stuff. But across the board, I think he's a really good singer. I mean, anytime you've got someone who's that consistently on pitch across so many different dynamic levels and so many different approaches to singing, I mean, that takes skill in and of itself. So he's definitely a good singer for sure. I am a fan. So that's it. I hope you all enjoyed this analysis. Please feel free to subscribe to me on Patreon if you do want to choose my analysis. Uh, one of the tiers lets you do that. I don't remember which one. There's also tiers on there where I give voice lessons. And speaking of which, I do offer voice lessons through Patreon and through privately. I do a free 30-minute vocal assessment to anyone who signs up for the first time on my website. And what we basically do is I spend 30 minutes explaining my teaching philosophy to you. And I listen to you and give you some quick feedback on some things. So please feel free to sign up for an assessment on my website if you'd like. The, I'll leave the link down in the description below. Also, please like and subscribe if you haven't yet because this channel is growing and growing. I need it to grow more. It's doing awesome and uh, I couldn't do it without you. So please like, please subscribe. Everything like that that you do helps. Also, please feel free to follow me on all my socials. I'll put them all here on the, on the screen for you so you can pick and choose which one you want to join. Sometimes I stream games on Twitch. Sometimes I stream games on YouTube. It just depends on which servers are acting better for me from day in and day out. But I have started streaming games some. So if you're a gamer and you just want to hang out and chat with me, let's do it. I, you know, I just do it for fun. I'm not trying to make a career out of being an online gamer or anything. It's just for fun so I can spend some time with you guys. So I hope you all enjoyed this analysis, and I will see you all next week. Take care. Thanks. Bye.